I am the coordinator for the Global READ program that's being brought to you today. Thanks so much for joining us. Sorry we, we got a little late. We're having trouble with uh, technical difficulties getting Daniel on our Zoom call today. Um, so thanks for being patient with us. Um, I want to thank Mimi, who's right now working in the background trying to get Daniel on with us. Um, we have, hopefully, <laughs> two very special people here uh, with us today. Um, on your screen, you can see this uh, lovely young man here. Um, his name is Brendan Osawa de Silva. He's from Emory University. And of course, we hope to have Daniel on with us, who's going to be talking with us about his book, A Force for Good, The Dalai Lama's Vision for Our World. Uh, but before we meet them, um, I'd, I'd like to tell you uh, that this program is being brought to you by the Charter for Compassion. We're an international organization whose mission is to, in a nutshell, promote the golden rule. Uh, we're sponsoring this program for you today and are excited about upcoming global reads that we have planned for you. Uh, of course, we would appreciate your generous donations to keep the programs coming your way. Uh, next month, we are uh, so pleased to also have a wonderful guest with us, um, Mrs. Mary Robinson, the former president of Ireland, who will be discussing her book, Climate Justice, Hope, Resilience, and the Fight for a Sustainable Future. Our guest host for that program will be Mark Barish, the founder of the Green World Campaign. Um, at the beginning of our program, uh, Brendan will be talking with Dan about his book, A Force for Good, but the second part of our program is designed to uh, set some time aside for you to answer, to ask any questions of our guest. And so if you'll note at the bottom of your screen, there's a, a little icon called chat. We encourage you to put any questions that you have, type those into that chat box. As soon as they come to your mind, you don't have to wait until it's Q&A time. Um, and then we'll get those to Dan so he can answer them. Um, thanks so much uh, for being here with us. Uh, again, we have a guest host with us, Brendan, who will introduce Dan, who happens to be a friend of Dan's. Um, so um, before we, we go, I'd just like to introduce Brendan to you. Uh, so Brendan serves as the Associate Director for Center for Compassion, Integrity, and Secular Ethics at Life University, but his full-time appointment is as Associate Director of Emory University's Center for Contemplative Science and Compassion-Based Ethics, where he's responsible for Emory's C, S-E-E, which stands for Social, Emotional, and Ethical Learning Program, which is a worldwide K-12 educational program based on compassion and secular ethics. Brennan worked closely with uh, the Dalai Lama's vision for our world as this program was developed. Welcome, Brendan. Um, I'll let you take it from here. Hopefully we have Dan on the line. We're not sure yet. <laughs> um, I'll be here if you need anything. I'll, and I'll let you know when we need to get um, to our viewers' questions. And just as a reminder to our guests, uh, again, thank you for being here. And the chat room is available for you to ask any questions um, for us. Welcome, Brendan. Thank you so much for being here. Thanks so much, Kate, and uh, mm -hmm. apologies to everybody for the technical difficulties. Um, we're trying to get Dan's audio and video working. Uh, Dan, I hope you can hear us. Yes, I can. Oh, and we can hear you. This is great. <laughs> oh, great. Good. Oh, fantastic. So I'm I was sorry you can't see me, but at least we can talk. That's the important thing. That's great. I was just joking that we managed to get Daniel Goleman um, zooming into India all the way from the States for the global launch of our sea learning program with the Dalai Lama in India in April for the press conference. And it, it went off without a hitch, but here in the States, we can't seem to get it to work. Um, but it's great to have you now on the audio, Dan. Um, so I'll just say a few words of introduction. I think you all know who uh, Daniel Goleman is, but um, we're, we're so happy to have him with us today. Um, he's perhaps uh, best known for uh, the incredible books that he's written, um, including the, uh, the book Emotional Intelligence, which came out in 1995 and really changed the way we think about emotions and our ability to 
uh, Be Aware of Our Emotions and Regulate Them. That book spent a year and a half on the New York Times bestseller list. It's been translated into over 40 languages. And it's really had a major change uh, worldwide in the way we think about emotions. Uh, one of the uh, impacts that book has had is in contributing to a movement called the Social Emotional Learning Movement in Education. And Dan was also a co-founder of the Collaborative for Academic Social and Emotional Learning, CASEL, which is the main organization uh, promoting and supporting this movement, um, which uh, is now a, a worldwide movement, uh, not just in the US, but, but even mandated and, and, and recommended in many countries around the world to teach children social emotional learning skills. Um, Dan has also played a very important role for organizations like the Mind and Life Organization, which organizes support uh, and supports contemplative science research, research around meditation. Uh, and dialogues between scientists and the Dalai Lama. He has been a participant and moderator of many of those dialogues, and he's been a participant and moderator of many of the events here at Emory University that we've set up with the Dalai Lama. We're very grateful to him for that. He has known the Dalai Lama for, um, I think, close to 40 years and has studied um, meditation and the, and the science of meditation for, for well over 40 years. Um, and we're here to talk about his, uh, one of his most recent books, which is uh, A Force for Good, The Dalai Lama's Vision for Our World. And I'd say pers personally, um, Dan's books have been very influential in my life and they're actually the reason why I am doing what I'm doing, which is now um, promoting social, emotional, and ethical learning in schools. Uh, his book, Destructive Emotions, which was a book on one of the dialogues with the Dalai Lama was the first book I read um, with the Dalai Lama as a, as a co-author. And uh, it introduced me to the science of, of compassion, um, to this emerging dialogue between contemplative practice and, and science, which I had never heard about, but I thought it was the most exciting thing ever. And uh, started me uh, in my graduate studies to, to, to doing what I'm doing now in studying psychology and education. And also more recently, another one of his books, The Triple Focus, um, which provided a new vision for education, which he co-wrote with Peter Senge, served as the foundation for the framework of our C-Learning program, uh, in which uh, he and Peter talked about the importance of an education that included inner, other, and outer focus, self-regulation, uh, compassion for others, and systems thinking. So. Uh, so he's had a huge influence on, on so many people, myself included. So thank you for being here uh, with us uh, today, Dan. A real pleasure, Brendan. Um, so uh, we're here to talk about your book, A Force for Good. Um, mm -hmm. I wonder if you could start by sharing um, what you, um, maybe a little bit about how this book came about and uh, what, what the intention or vision of this book was. Sure. Uh, you know, over the years, uh, and by the way, Brendan, can you hear me okay? Yes. You're coming in. Yes. So over, over, over the many years I've known the Dalai Lama, I've heard him uh, often talk about what really is a, a single message, but he does it in different ways in different contexts. And for his 80th birthday, uh, his translator, uh, Tupton Jimpa, who's a close friend also, suggested it be a good time to pull it all together and to give his vision for the world, uh, which is really about a force for good, uh, to put it in one place, in one book. So that was how we did it. It was Tipton Jimpa that asked me to do it. And of course, the Dalai Lama was very cooperative. Uh, and I found his message, when, once we put it together, very, very powerful. Can I read you a passage from the book? That would be wonderful. Please do. Uh, it's very to the point. It's, it's really asking how can we build the world we want? Uh, and that's what the Dalai Lama calls us to create. He has a unique perspective that gives him a sense of where the human family goes wrong and what we can do to get on track to a better story. He envisions a much needed antidote to the tragedies of the, fast, of the past, a force for good. He embodies and speaks for that better force. That force begins by countering the energies within the human mind that drive our negativity to change the future from a sorry retread of the past 
the Dalai Lama tells us, we need to transform our own minds, weaken the pull of our destructive emotions, and so strengthen our better natures. Without that inner shift, we stay vulnerable to knee-jerk reactions like rage, frustration, and hopelessness. But with this positive inner shift, we can more naturally embody a concern for others, and so act with compassion, the core of moral responsibility. This the Dalai Lama says, prepares us to enact a larger mission with a new clarity, calm, and caring. We can tackle intractable problems like corrupt decision makers and tuned out elites, greed and self-interest as guiding motives, the indifference of the powerful to the powerless. That's his message in a nutshell. That is, uh, that's wonderful, Dan. And I was following along with you um, the next sentence, I think, is really powerful, too. <laughs> By beginning the social revolution inside our own minds, the Dalai Lama's vision aims to avoid the blind alleys of past movements for the better. I think that's such a strong point, because it's not enough to just go through the outer motions. If we don't transform ourselves, he says, it really rings hollow. It's not the same, doesn't have the same force. That's great. Thank you so much. It's a real treat to hear the author um, <laughs> of, a, of a work reading his own work. Uh, and that's a great passage that you read. Um, uh, I, I want to ask you to unpack it a little bit, because when I first got, um, got this copy of the book and I saw it was called The Force for Good, the Dalai Lama, I just assumed that you were saying the Dalai Lama is the force for good, um, which, which he is, I think. Uh, and and you, you do say that. But actually what he's saying is a little bit different. He's saying that that we are a force for good, that we have this potential. And, um, and there's something quite radical, I think, right here that you just opened the book with here in these first pages, which is, he's, you know, you're, you're talking about all the problems that we have in this world, the environment, war, corruption, political issues that we have, overpopulation, violence. And then, you know, we all need, we need, we all know we need to do something about that. And yet the solution is perhaps somewhat counterintuitive that we know we need to take action, but what kind of action do we need to take? The transformation of our own minds, a social revolution inside our own minds. Could you unpack a little bit more? What you well, yes. I mean, it starts there. He calls it emotional hygiene. You know, get clarity, get calm, see the system. He really is a systems thinker. He sees, see what's going on in a bigger picture and then find your point of leverage. He says, each of us is a leader. Each of us has a sphere of influence. Each of us can do something that's unique. And, you know, it might be because we know X, Y, Z people. It might be because we have this position or this skill set, whatever it is. He says, act from clarity and compassion, but act now. Even if you're not going to see the fruit of your action in your own lifetime, start it now. He, he's very emphatic. He's a real activist. Yeah. Um, that's a theme that really comes out throughout the book is that um, these problems can seem so large. Um, there's, a, there's a great uh, chapter that you have in the book on the environment. That's a classic case of a problem that can seem so large, so intractable, it can make us feel hopeless and helpless. But there's this real message of hope throughout the book. Um, do you feel that uh, the Dalai Lama is, is a very hopeful person, that, that he's given us good reason to feel hopeful? Well, I think he's, he's a realistic optimist, frankly. He sees the problems, you know, vividly and the tragedy and the suffering. And yet, and yet, he says, if you take a long view, actually things are getting better and better and better. I think that's true, except for the environment. We can get to that. But uh, what he says is it's because people have taken action. It's because people haven't been passive. And that's why I think he encourages each of us to do what we can. Yeah, there's... Um... What, um, and I, I just saw a note saying that I need to speak a little bit louder. <laughs> so I hope everybody can hear me. Um, what do you see as some of the, the concrete actions that he is proposing that we take um, in dealing with some of these very large and tractable problems? Well, you, you know, he, he outlines um, problems like uh, corruption. He lives in, in Asia and, and many Asian countries, sadly, like many others in, uh, in that part of the world and maybe throughout the world, 
have some degree of corruption, you know, people getting uh, money on the side and so on. And he says, you know, uh, expose it, be transparent and be fierce in exposing it. Uh, we need transparency, fairness and accountability. Well, you know, uh, that's, that's a bold action. He says, um, you know, the rich poor gap is a moral crime. Uh, we need an economics that sees, that has concern and not greed as its core motivation. Well, that's a very radical point of view, but that's his, that's where he comes from. You know, help those in need, but the best help is to help them help themselves, if you can find a way to do that. And then heal the earth. Uh, he sees that the the biggest problem is that our house is on fire, and we're not doing enough. We're not seeing how the way we live our lives, the things we use, the things we buy, are slowly degrading the earth. And he see, he thinks we should take a there we should have transparency and accountability starting with ourselves but also holding companies or uh, you know systems of manufacture to account and then he you know the the one thing that i think is very um, strong in his message is education he says the people of the 20th century have created the problem it's going to be the people of the 21st century today's children and young people who will have to solve these problems uh, and that's why he's so emphatic about education, but a new kind of education. And Brendan, I know you're involved in one of the programs he values most, the C learning uh, that was developed at Emory. Could you say a little bit about it? <laughs> sure, I'd be happy to. Um, this is a program we've been developing at Emory, uh, and Dan himself has been uh, playing a very important role in helping us develop this program. Uh, it's called C Learning, which stands for Social, Emotional, and Ethical Learning, and it's a free program for global implementation, K through 12. The Dalai Lama is our uh, sponsor and our inspiration for the program. Uh, and the name, actually, uh, Dan, you yourself gave us the name of the program in one of our meetings with you and the Dalai Lama in Indianapolis, where you suggested we had a Social and Emotional Learning, SEL, and we could call this program, which incorporates the Dalai Lama's idea of ethical education and ethical intelligence uh, by calling the program social, emotional, and ethical learning, C learning. So we changed our name from the much less sexy secular ethics in education, which is what it was called. <laughs> learning, on the basis of that advice. And many, many people have told us that, that was very good advice <laughs> that we took from you. Um, and um, uh, yeah, and uh, uh, perhaps Kate and others at the Charter of Compassion can uh, provide a link to our resources for any educators or people interested in education. And, uh, and we're very happy that recently the Charter for Compassion also endorsed our program uh, as a K through 12 about compassion. Um, there's a, there's a, there's a, uh, as I mentioned earlier, we base our program on um, both the Dalai Lama's writings and also uh, this book that you wrote with Peter Senge. Um, on the triple focus, and, and you mentioned systems thinking. One of the key things we're trying to add is not just the ethics and compassion element, but the systems thinking into social emotional learning. And there's a, there's a section that uh, I wonder if I could point to in your book, uh, the force for, A Force for Good, which is really interesting, which is in, in how are we going to educate people, young people, to deal with problems that are so large and, and systemic as, as dealing with the environment. And you write here that when, when, it looks, when we look at the cost of the environment, this is on the top of page 142, um, that a lot of these, what we call insults to nature, uh, the harm we're doing, you say, unfortunately, these are either too macro or micro for our senses to take in. We have no perceptual apparatus to sense directly global warming or lung damaging particulates from auto exhaust. Moreover, the time horizon at which such assaults occur spans decades and centuries too slow a pace to notice. And I think this is so important because the way I read it, what you're suggesting uh, is that we're not really equipped that well yet. Evolution hasn't yet equipped us that well to uh, deal with systems uh, and, and the, the threats to the environment that we've created. But I think um, the Dalai Lama is suggesting that we have the ability to to cultivate that, and you and your writings also suggest that we have the ability to cultivate um, those capacities. Would you say that's true? Yeah, I think we have to learn it. I don't think we can wait for evolution. It's not going to be in our 
genes fast enough. It's going to have to be a social uh, evolution where we teach children from the beginning to understand the systems that uh, we're all enmeshed in and to see where there might be points of leverage, places where things can change. For example, in that same chapter, uh, I describe a, a methodology that lets the ecological environmental impacts of a, a material object during its lifespan become transparent and at every level. And that allows you to see where the worst impacts are and make a change. And I think, you know, for today's children, as they grow into consumers as adults, uh, this may be a new uh, normal. That is, it may be that uh, companies will realize, hey, uh, consumers now actually care about the environment. It's getting worse and worse. And we're going to show them that we care too. We're going to look at our own impacts and show them that we're improving them because that's a good business strategy. Uh, I think we'll see more thinking like that, but it really takes understanding the whole system. Yeah, there's, um, it's, this is a really great uh, chapter and I encourage those of you on the call or watching the video who have not yet read this book, here's, uh, here's what it looks like to, to get this book and read it because there, there's incredible stuff in here. And uh, this chapter on the environment called Heal the Earth was particularly powerful for me. In it, you talked about actually calculating the carbon footprint of this book. Of, of the flights. That <laughs> right. Yeah. And, and you came up with 15.79 tons of CO2 from airborne carbon added by the plane flights for this book. And that just made me nervous because it made me think about all the, the international travel uh, my colleagues and I have been doing to promote our sea learning program around the world, uh, which is very encouraging work. But it, it, it did make me feel a little bit guilty but then amazingly, you talked about calculating the uh, offsets, the, the, the carbon offsets that it would take, um, which amazingly only came to $184 for all six airplanes. This is the amazing thing. You can get offsets for, your, for the bad you're doing, which means you're neutral. That, that's at least being less bad. Uh, I am interested in uh, new work that's going on in regenerative uh, processes, you know, farming and manufacturing and so on, because I think that's, that says maybe we can do a little restorative work, but at the very least, we could do the math to get offsets. As you point out, they're not that, they're surprisingly inexpensive, uh, but they remediate the carbon that you spew out if you're, you know, on a jet. That was incredible. I mean, I, I expected that number to be much uh, higher and so that was actually very encouraging. You talked about um, ways that that money could go uh, to uh, cooking stoves, for example, uh, more efficient cooking stoves. Um, and then you also talked about this idea, which I hadn't heard about before, which is in addition to calculating our carbon footprint, talking about our handprint, which is the uh, the, the good that we could be doing to uh, to heal the environment and to offset. The Yes, this is a, a wonderful concept by a, a, a guy who teaches life cycle assessment, which is the methodology for uh, gauging all of these impacts at, uh, I think, the Harvard School of Public Health. His name is Gregory Norris. And the idea of a handprint is that uh, you not only uh, try to lower your footprint, but you try to do good and track that and convince other people to do it. And then they become part of your handprint. So it's a, it's a positive measure and it helps you keep going. I think it's very motivational. I think the footprint is kind of a, a bummer uh, because it's very large, but it, everything we do to reduce it becomes part of our handprint. And the, the more we do, the bigger that gets. And that's an, a wonderful thing to keep track of. That's the good we do. Yeah, that's, that's great. I mean, um, so as I, as I read through that chapter, I went from myself feeling less helpless and hopeless to more hopeful. Um, and that idea of balancing the footprint with the handprint, we hear so much more about the carbon footprint and so much less about our ability to take action to bring about that. It seems well, like, yeah, sorry. Go, uh, go ahead, Brendan, sorry. I was just gonna yeah. say, it seems like that theme of balance. Uh, you, you said, I said, is the, is the Dalai Lama very hopeful? And you said, well, he's a realist. 
And that, that theme of balance seems to run through the book, that yes, there are, there are very serious problems and we, we know about a lot of them, we could know more, but we need to balance that with what we can do, with the, with the, the action, the productive action we can take, a sense of hope, uh, a, a realistic sense of hope, and, and looking at uh, the, the positives and the strengths that are there, that are the resources that are available for us for turning things around. Well, and each of us has access to some of these resources. And, uh, you know, if we become an aggregate of individuals doing good together, we become this force for good. And that could be a very large force. In fact, it, there already are so many people doing good, uh, but we could each add to it. Yeah, great, great. Um, I, I wanted to ask you a question. You, you talk about... Um, a story that I've heard others recount also, which is Paul Ekman meeting the Dalai Lama for the first time and the really transformative effect it had on him. Uh, and, and he went on to write uh, a few books with the Dalai Lama. He's gone on to really focus on compassion, develop programs of cultivating emotional balance. It had a huge effect on him both personally and professionally. You've known the Dalai Lama now for I think over 35 years. What has that relationship meant to you personally, professionally? Oh. Well, I always thought the Dalai Lama was who I wanted to be when I grew up. <laughs> I've always seen him as a real role model. Uh, he, you know, he's really selfless, he's really present, he's really loving and concerned. Uh, and um, I find him a very powerful ideal type of someone. It, just knowing someone like that is alive on the planet, I find is very encouraging. Uh, because it says, well, maybe each of us can move in that direction to some degree. Mm -hmm. Has your understanding of him changed in any way over these almost four decades? Well, you know, I, when I first met him, which was in the 80s, he said to me that he wanted to learn about science. Uh, and so I thought, well, you know, maybe I'll help uh, arrange some tutorials in essence, which were the early meetings of these mind and life dialogues. That I think you mentioned in passing at any rate, um, uh, as I've gotten to know him, I see that he actually is a very keen uh, philosophical and scientific thinker. And he really ends up challenging scientists that we brought to him and getting them to think about, well, what's, what's the next thing? What don't we really know? What are the ethical issues involved? In other words, he brings so much to the table. And I hadn't realized that at first. Yeah. Um, could you, I wonder if you could say more about that, because this is something that fewer people know about the Dalai Lama, which is a strong interest in science. Uh, we talked about you know, dealing with these issues. We talked about social action. We've talked about ethics. What role does science play in that? Why is the Dalai Lama so interested in science? He sees science as very akin to his own spiritual tradition and training as a, a, a mode of knowing reality. And he really respects it, but he sees that there are other ways of knowing too. And he feels that some, there's some synergism between these. Uh, and I think he, he creates that when he talks to scientists. So uh, he's also always had a, a kind of natural interest in science since he was a kid. He, he, and there was no science in Lhasa when he was there, but he, he was eager to learn everything he could. And as soon as he got out of Tibet in 59, when the Chinese communists invaded, uh, he uh, tried to meet with quantum physicists, scientists of all kinds, and have them uh, basically teach him what they knew. Yeah, and, and as you mentioned, um not only has he been learning for, from scientists, but uh, it seems that scientists have been influenced by their interactions with him. Can you think of um, any examples that you've uh, observed of that or any stories or, or, or cases besides uh, Dr. Ekman where you know this has happened? Well, uh, let's start with Ekman because he's a very good case in point. Paul Ekman is a world's expert on reading uh, facial ex emotional impact and meaning of facial expressions. And when he met the Dalai Lama, he said he was really struck. He'd never seen a face that was so mobile. What he meant by that is, he says, each of us has a range of emotion that we don't experience, that we don't express facially. 
we learn this unconsciously in childhood. Different cultures favor certain emotions and suppress others. Certain families do the same. He said the Dalai Lama expresses the free range, full range of emotion. And uh, that was the one thing that struck him. The other <clears throat> was that um, he'd never seen anyone who was so empathic in the sense that whenever he met someone else, he would immediately reflect their emotional state. If they're very sad, he'd be sad. If they're upbeat, he'd be upbeat, if they're whatever it was, but then he'd drop it right away. Uh, he'd never seen that uh, uh, resilience. Resilience is uh, scientists define as going from the peak of a emotional state like being upset to back to your normal baseline. And uh, he's remarkable that way. And then Paul, uh, the Dalai Lama encouraged Paul to come up with an atlas of emotion because he felt it was very important for people to understand, to have self-awareness about their emotional states and that you could learn more uh, about the possibilities through uh, what Paul has now done. You can see it at paulekman.com. So Paul was one scientist. Actually, he's been very transformed by his meetings with the Dalai Lama. But we've seen it uh, over the years with many scientists that we brought to these dialogues with the Dalai Lama, particularly in terms of their starting to reflect on the ethics of what they're doing. Uh, he's a very strong ethicist, and of course he sees an ethic of compassion as the most compelling. Uh, and I think this is an eye-opener for many scientists because science pr tries to pretend that it's value neutral. Uh, but uh, he says, no, it's, it really isn't, that you are making things better or you're making them worse, and science can do a lot to make them better. The other thing, uh, that's a great point, and the other thing scientists might think is we can't go in the direction of ethics because that sounds like religion. But the Dalai Lama seems to be suggesting that's not necessarily the case. The Dalai Lama, uh, even though he comes from a religious background, when he talks ethics, he calls it secular ethics, meaning non-religious. It's a kind of uh, a humanism. It's just based in our, what he calls the oneness of humanity, our understanding of uh, the way in which we're all the same. And therefore, uh, we care about each other uh, as, because we are the same. So he, his, the logic of his compassion is one that doesn't depend on any religious belief system. Um, yeah, one of the, uh, that's great. One of the questions that's coming in uh, is uh, this, whether, is this notion of spirituality or even spiritual intelligence? Uh, one of the people is asking a question, um, does, does this, does it, do these ideas interface with the notion of spiritual of SQ spiritual intelligence, say as described by Dana Zohar in her book and others. Uh, I'm not familiar with that book. I don't know if you are, um, but do you have a sense about what the relationship is between spirituality, which is where, where some people might go in thinking about this, these, these kind of more basic human values? Well, uh, I actually, I'm, I'm not familiar. With, I've heard much about Zohar's work, but never read the book. Uh, but spiritual intelligence uh, is, a, a kind of a modality that I think uh, the Dalai Lama exemplifies. He's, he's very spiritual and very intelligent about it. And he actually is a logician too. He's been trained uh, since he was young in logical thinking. And he brings that to his spiritual thinking. And he supports, for example, his ethic of compassion, which sea learning, by the way, has brought to social emotional learning, which I think that's very important. He supports that through a kind of logical analysis. So his spiritual uh, intelligence is not kind of, you know, woo-woo and flaky, but it's actually very well grounded in uh, logical thinking and actually in social science, biological science. Yeah, that's a, that's a great point. And it's, uh, the Dalai Lama has a, another book that I really love called The Universe in a Single Atom. I'm sure you know as well, the convergence of science and spirituality. Um, I think it's something that's kind of amazing uh, that, that we can have uh, a vision where science and spirituality can go hand in hand and not be a lot. Exactly. And I think anyone uh, who might want to look into that more would do well to look at the book, uh, The Universe in a Single Atom. Great, great. Um, 
I, I wonder, um, I mean, we, you've talked about this a little bit, but um, this idea, uh, when we, we, want to, we want to cultivate compassion, uh, we want to take action, uh, but a thing that can happen is, uh, is burnout, um, compassion fade, um, just the sense of, uh, I mean, it ties in with what we we're talking about, the, the sense of hopelessness. How do you think the Dalai Lama, as a person who's thinking about the world's problems, traveling the world, which is something you detail quite a lot in your, in your book, and, and someone who's thinking also multi-generationally, thinking on such a large scale, how do you think he's able to, to cultivate compassion and compassionate action without burning out, without having uh, compassion fade, without... Um, yeah, I actually think for him and for uh, most all of us, compassion itself is an inoculation. The, the um, problem of emotional exhaustion, which comes, you see it in nursing, for example, anybody who's trying to help people who are, you know, angry and frustrated and anxious and fearful and, you know, you absorb those emotions. The brain is designed to do that. But it turns out that if you can have compassion for them, if you can love them at the same time, instead of tuning out and turning away, which is all too common a way, uh, for, as a way people handle that exhaustion, uh, you know, at least to burn out and I quit. Instead of doing that, you're able to stay with them. It's like a parent and a kid who's having a meltdown. You know, you, you stay with the kid because you love that child. And you help them through the meltdown, and, and then they come out of it. And I think that uh, his persistence, and he's very fervent about being persistent, don't never give up, he says, never give up, uh, comes from this deep commitment to compassion. Yeah, it's, it's remarkable. Um, you, you joked, um, or maybe it was only half a joke, that um, the Dalai Lama was the person you wanted to be when you grew up. Um, and I think uh, I can resonate with that. Uh, he's such an admirable person. Uh, he's, he's a unique person, certainly. But that, that can also create the sense of distance, which is, well, I mean, we might aspire to be like the Dalai Lama, but how could we ever be like the Dalai Lama? He says he's just a person just like all of us. Um, do you think it's possible for someone to become like that? I mean, is that... Is that well, you know, you know, he is uh, pretty extraordinary in that he's worked at it at a level most any of us will never do. On the other hand, I think it's a spectrum. There's a gradient. He's maybe, uh, you know, an, an ideal at the far end of that gradient. But any of us can move toward it. We can be less self-centered. We can be less greedy. We can be less focused on I, me, mine and more empathic, more attuned to people around us, more wanting to help them, more concerned about what's for their good, not just what's for me. Uh, and to the extent we do that, and you can do it in a hundred ways, I think we do become more like the Dalai Lama. So I, I think it's, a, it's not that uh, that's a goal in itself, but rather uh, it tells us that there's a gradient, there's a dimension we can move along. And any of us can move along it to some degree. You, um, you, you talk you talk in your book about how he he just he trains at this a lot more than most of us do. He spends four hours every morning meditating, one hour in the evening. That's five hours a day, which is uh, that's a lot of time, especially for someone who's so busy. Um, Meditation is something that you have yourself studied for, for, I believe, over 40 years. You recently came out with another great book. Um, you and the Dalai Lama come out with a lot of great books. Uh, this one with Richie Davidson called Altered Traits. Uh, Science reveals how meditation changes your mind, brain, and body. Um, it's hard, even for me, somebody who has done a little bit of study with, with meditation, to imagine how somebody could spend five hours a day meditating and what that would do to a person. Uh, I wonder if you could share your thoughts on that. Well, you know, what, uh, Davidson and I, Davidson is a neuroscientist in Wisconsin, and we were graduate students together, known each other a long time. So uh, Davidson's group looked at the more than 6,000 peer review articles on meditation and just found the like 60, the 1% that are really tip top in quality. And those were the ones we reviewed in the book. And, you know, some of them show that 
positive changes come right at the beginning. Uh, if you do mindfulness, you do any kind of meditation, you get more focused, you get more, you get calmer. Uh, if you do a, a compassion meditation that cultivates the qualities of loving kindness, and you become a kinder person by many uh, measures. But we also found there's a dose response phenomena where the more lifetime hours you put in, the stronger the effects seem to become. So long-term meditators uh, get even m more calmer. They come back from being upset much more quickly than other people do. They uh, can keep their attention focused uh, or use, uh, they're more nimble with attention, for example. And when you get to the level, the well, kind of Olympic level, and Davidson was able to fly over yogis who've done tens of thousands of hours of meditation, uh, you see that their brains are actually transformed, that they function in, in a very different way. I just heard from Davidson a wonderful finding. He just published this. Uh, mm -hmm. They took pictures of uh, meditators and they had people match for age and so on. They showed the pictures to random people and they found that uh, people like the meditators more than they do average people. Somehow you become more likable, more friendly maybe, uh, but people are picking something up. So I think there are qualities that become developed and, and the more you time you put into it, like any other skill or expertise that you want to practice, you know, golf's probably the same, the more hours of learning and improving you put in, the stronger the benefits become. You're, that's amazing. You're saying that um, they just responded more positively just to the photos of the meditators? Just to the photos, yeah. They didn't know who these people were. All they did was say which photos they liked most. And it turned out that a random sample of people just like the meditators' pictures the most. Wow. Well, it's um, it's it's funny because just just before this call, our uh, program uh, coordinator was telling me that anytime she posts something, she was posting about this um, about this call that we're on last night to our C Learning uh, listserv and Facebook page. And um, since the Dalai Lama's picture is on a force for good, she says anytime she does a post with the Dalai Lama's picture. We get way more likes <laughs> and <laughs> Might be because the Dalai Lama has a very good image. <laughs> yeah. A lot. yeah. Um, that's fascinating. Um, we, um, I, I was, um, Kate was actually supposed to moderate the questions coming in, and I think I stole her job because <laughs> I started taking them. I'm sorry. Um, but we have, uh, we have about 10 minutes left. Um, to open it up, uh, you've been very generous with your time in taking my questions, but anybody who has uh, questions for Dr. Goldman uh, about the book, about the Dalai Lama, um, please feel to, to share, please, please feel free to share that with us. Or Kate, if you have any questions. I, I was just going to uh, pass along a couple of comments. Um, mm. One was from Marla, who said that Paul Ekman reported that he lost his anger against his dad right after meeting uh, his wife. Oh, that's right. That was the strongest thing I forgot. Paul Ekman had a terrible relationship with his father. And he uh, every week he would have an anger outburst that he regretted later. But he said after he met the Dalai Lama, he didn't get angry for about a year. That's amazing. Yeah, uh, that is amazing. Becca, I didn't find out where she was from. I tried to, um, but she said she's so thankful for the social emotional learning. Um, her daughter's school uses this approach and it helped her to raise her kiddo. Um, and she's learned so, learned and grown so much because of it. So that's really cool. And then, Could I say something there about social emotional learning? This is a movement that was started about 25 years ago. Uh, and the idea is that kids need to know more than just math and history and reading, that they need to learn how to be aware of their own inner world, how to manage themselves and their emotions well, how to tune into other people and how to use all of that to, you know, collaborate and get on with other kids. That's called social emotional learning. And there are now, you know, more than 100 curricula. It's a worldwide movement. Uh, and the, it's very well-researched, very evidence-based. It turns out that kids who are in these programs compared to those who aren't 
uh, you know, on average, they have 10% uh, more pro-social behavior, like liking school, feeling someone that cares about them. A 10% less antisocial behavior, like bullying and fights. And their academic achievement scores go up about 11%. And these um, percentages are stronger in, in schools that, where they're needed more. So it's a very positive movement. And the Dalai Lama uh, not just endorses it, but he worked with a group at Emory, as Brendan mentioned, uh, to develop his own curriculum, which adds ethics and systems thinking which I think are very, very important uh, to, the, to the mix. Uh, and this is C-learning. So I'm glad to hear from a parent that this has been helpful. We also had in the comments a comment from uh, Terry saying that Australia is now implementing C-learning, which I didn't even know of. So it's great to hear that. <laughs> yeah, um, great. It's global. Yeah, fantastic. Um, it's really interesting what you said, Dan, about how these effects are even seem to be stronger in areas that need it more, um, uh, because there can be an image that social and emotional learning is kind of an add on. It's a nice extra for kids in more affluent schools or communities. But um, but I, actually, I no, it's it's strongest in the inner city and, and uh, poor schools mm -hmm. and often brought in by school districts who are trying to find something to help kids. Uh, and it turns out, uh, as I pointed out, if you can manage your own emotions better and get along with other kids, which, of course, the big melodramas of childhood are all about other kids, you do better in school. You learn better. Yeah, that's great. I mean, we... Uh, uh, as uh, partners in other countries work with us in the C-learning program here at Emory, a lot of them in India and in, uh, in Latin America are working with uh, very, very uh, underprivileged kids, uh, including kids in, in slum or favela communities, places like that. Right, and yeah. Really seeing transformative impacts. From Wonderful. Yeah, it's great. Um, I've got two more questions here. One from Marla. Any by uh, you, uh, Dr. Goldman, on the polyvagal theory, the compassion nerve? Uh, the polyvagal theory, uh, the vagal nerve uh, manages the, the heart. It's very important connector from the emotional centers of the brain to the uh, biology of the body. And the, uh, you, you could interpret everything we found about the biology of meditation in terms of polyvagal theory. It seems to uh, strengthen the ability to manage upset, uh, which of course makes you calm and clear. So I think that yes, there's a real resonance. What's the other question? The other question is from Patty. Uh, she says, where do retired teachers go with this? Uh, can we use this in a non-academic setting? And being a retired teacher, I'm anxious to hear your answer myself. Well, I, I would say anybody can use it. I mean, it's not just for kids. <clears throat> I think that the, the basic lessons of self-awareness, self-management, empathy, and getting along uh, are useful at any age and for anyone. In fact, that's, those are the four components of emotional intelligence. I've just started a, a coaching practice uh, in, in that area of emotional intelligence that helps people uh, strengthen those uh, four qualities. And I'd love to see it uh, extended into maybe retirement communities or, uh, you know, people who are uh, now retired and, and want to use their time well in other ways. I think retirement age is a fiction these days. And why not uh, help other people? Thank you. Uh, I, I have been through the Compassionate Integrity Training, and so has Terry, who's been on here from, with us from Australia. And um, that would be another avenue that approaches. Yeah, yeah, exactly. There are many ways. Mm -hmm. there, there's a great section on that point uh, in your book, A Force for Good, where uh, you're detailing a presentation that was given to the Dalai Lama on social emotional learning, and he asked a question if I'm remembering this passage correctly, ask a question saying, but you know, what's being done for the teachers? How are they being prepared? And um, I think that goes to your point that these skills, social emotional skills are really for everybody. And the more we learn them ourselves, the better we can um, uh, help others learn them. And in fact, Paul Ekman uh, with Alan Wallace, a meditation teacher, developed a program for teachers called Emotional Balance 
uh, because teachers, of course, are crucial to what happens to students. And it, it's not enough just to help students. You really need to help teachers embody this so that they can teach it with conviction. Yeah, I will say um, that in the C-Learning program, uh, thanks to the generous financial support of the Dalai Lama, all our materials are free. And there's also an online uh, free course that people can take called C101 on our website. The website's elearning.emory.edu. And, um, and you don't have to be a teacher in a school to take that. Anybody can take it. Um, and then the curriculum and framework uh, become freely available to you to download. And you can use those in any settings. Um, so that's a, a very generous thing the Dalai Lama has done. And I just want to say um, in closing, because I think we're running out of time, that this book that you did with the Dalai Lama, and you, you, you saved this to, to share with this at the very end, um, that you, uh, you did as a kind of 80th birthday present to the Dalai Lama, both you and the Dalai Lama have very generously donated um, all the profits uh, for this book to charity, uh, which I think is, uh, is a great act of compassion, a great example for all of us also. So thank you so much for that. Thank you, Brendan. Yeah, he's a great model. He does it all every time, <laughs> no matter what, what the event. So thank you. It's been a pleasure to be here. And uh, Kate, I think this is a wonderful, wonderful project that you're doing. And I want to thank you. I want to thank you both for being here with us today. It has been just a pleasure to meet both of you. Um, thank you for taking the time out of your incredibly busy schedules to be with us today. Um, I also want to thank the audience and our viewers today um, for being here and joining us, whether you're here right now live with us or watching it later. Um, this program is brought to you by the Charter for Compassion, and um, we'd like to introduce you to our, our book for next month. Um, it is uh, Climate Justice by Mrs. Mary Robinson, the former president of Ireland. And so she'll be here with us bright and early on October 2nd. So um, thanks again, Brendan, so much for being here. Daniel, thank you so much. Uh, have a wonderful rest of your day or evening, wherever you are in the world, everyone. Thank you, Kate. Thank you. Great talking with you, Dan, as always. Thank you. So uh, thanks again, Brendan. Thanks, Kate. Thank you. Bye. Bye.